Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this interview, Cruncher, gaining insight how war in Ukraine impacts global food supplies. I'm Sadia Kainzik, Head of Communications at GAIN and moderator of this episode. Before February 24th, the world was the theater of a double whammy of drought and catastrophe stemming from climate change and the COVID pandemic that hit us really hard. Now with the war in Ukraine and in just a few weeks, we see that millions of people may be put into harm's way, going far beyond Ukraine. De-escalation is key. Today, our panelists, all from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, will try and give a prismatic view of what this war will entail from a food shortage spectrum. Stella Nordhagen, our expert in knowledge leadership, will give us some facts and figures and proof points on the trends we see and potential implications for global hunger. Lawrence Haddad, our executive director, will give the global perspective of such impact and what key stakeholders can do to counter it. Wubit Girma, the new country director in Ethiopia, warm welcome to her, will give the country and sub-Sahara perspective. Oftentimes, Africa is said to be the breadbasket of the world. Could they step up? And Pinjanim Kambula, our global program lead for large-scale food fortification, will speak about one effective tool that works when everything else falls apart, and that's food fortification. Why it matters, especially when faced with food insecurity. Pinjani, welcome. So, Pinjani, if you could tell us, uh, please, um, what is the status of food fortification, especially for the big staple foods like uh, oil, wheat, uh, and maize? Just give us a snapshot of the status of uh, food fortification regarding those big staples worldwide. Thank you. Thanks, Edia. So there's been a huge progress, particularly over the last 20 years or so, uh, regarding the status of food fortification globally. So to give you some figures, you know, for example, 90 countries now uh, have mandatory legislation for fortification of wheat. That is to say, by law, industry in those countries need to fortify wheat with one or more micronutrients as mandated by the governments. Uh, in, ten, in terms of maize, there is at least 19 countries uh, where fortification of, of maize is, is mandatory. 12 of those are in Africa. By the way, the 90 countries on wheat, you know, over 50% of those are in Africa and Asia. And talking about edible oils, uh, at present, there's laws in at least 33 countries where, man, uh, where fortification of edible oils is mandatory. So that's fortifying edible oils with, I, with vitamin A or vitamin A and D. And you know, over 90% of those are in Africa and Asia. So that's the status of play uh, in terms of fortification globally. The one thing to note is that a large number of those countries uh, import raw materials you know, from Russia and Ukraine. So for example, wheat, is a, uh, Russia is, a, uh, is a, a large supplier to a number of countries in Africa and Asia, and the same is true about Ukraine. Uh, but when it comes to edible oils, Ukraine is a major uh, exporter of, of sunflower oils to, to a number of these countries, as well as also a major exporter of maize. So that's the current status. And, and those are the sources. So, Pinjani, what would be the, um, uh, the impact of the war in uh, uh, such program, in the food fortification program? So, we're seeing impacts at, at three levels. Uh, to begin with, we're seeing impacts uh, regarding agricultural inputs. So, remember, staple foods, uh, you know, we start at, at the farming level. Uh, so, wheat and maize. Farmers need fertilizers to grow wheat and maize, which they supply to millers or industry for processing into fortified flour. Uh, a lot of countries import fertilizers from, from Russia. Uh, the disrupt disruption in supply chains means that uh, some countries may have to go elsewhere for their requirements of wheat or they may experience delays. So that could have an impact on productivity of wheat or maize in these countries which then has a further impact on provision of fortified foods. So that's, that's at the agricultural level. We are also seeing impacts regarding raw materials. So like I said earlier, a, lot, a number of countries import raw materials, either wheat or maize from Russia or Ukraine, but also sunflower 
uh, where Ukraine is, 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 is a big exporter. So that has an impact in availability of raw material. And if that raw material is not available to be processed, then you don't necessarily have the fortified wheat flour or, or, or maize flour or edible oils. So that's, that's, that's the second impact. And the, uh, and the third is, is, is the rise in prices. So generally speaking, the prices of grain on the world market are going up because of, of, of the conflict. That has a further impact on businesses that are importing uh, the grains or, or, or sunflower oil for further processing. It means it affects the businesses, but it also affects the availability of, um, uh, of fortified foods because the prices are higher and, pe and people are paying higher prices and those that are vulnerable or those that are poor may not be able to afford. So we see those three impacts uh, uh, across fortification problems. And Johnny, for your programs where we carry in gain countries, do you foresee any major uh, hindrances? It, it, it's a mixed. It's a mixed picture. We are very early in, uh, in, in in the conflict situation, but yes, we do. Nigeria, for example, imports a lot of um, uh, of, of wheat from from that region. So that could have an impact if food producers in those countries do not find alternative supplies of, of wheat in, in good time. But this situation is replicated a, 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 a lot across a number of countries, like as I've already said. Benjani, you have rightly said that uh, governments and food producers, they, they have what it takes to mitigate the uh, impact of, uh, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, so what can be done for the food fortification here? How can they mitigate that? So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, at three levels again. One is uh, for those countries who are major exporters of grain, uh, or uh, in the case of sunflower, you know, major exporters of, 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 of oil seed. And, and, you know, some countries are beginning to, to, to place, you know, export bans or, you know, export restrictions or quotas uh, because they're worried about food security. That shouldn't really be happening because we'll make you know, a bad situation worse. So you know, for countries that are major grain producers, I think this is the time for solidarity around the world and not make a situation worse. But for importing countries, they also have a responsibility in terms of helping, whether it's food importers or food producers within those countries in, in, in terms of you know, finding alternative sources. So diversifying, where they import their raw materials from, but also looking at what else can they do locally in terms of you know, it's substituting imports of, of, of raw materials. Uh, given the expected increase uh, in, in, in the price of uh, fortified foods as a, as a result of the increase in the cost of wheat, for example, uh, you know, there's other, there's other, there are also other things that governments can do. One of them, for example, could be exempting, you know, customs duties and tariffs on vitamin and mineral premiums to make sure that you know, fortified foods are, are affordable. But for those countries that also have some other tariffs you know, or duties on these products as, as, as grain, maybe this is also a time to think about suspending you know, some of them because the prices are going up. We need to make food uh, readily available. So another thing that governments can do uh, is utilizing customs green lanes. And, and what I mean by that is that at point of imports or at border crossings, government can prioritize the clearance of, you know, staple foods to make sure that the foods are readily available. So that, that's what the concept of customs green, green lanes is, is, is all about, you know, prioritizing clearance of, of certain commodities that may be required uh, uh, in a country. So that's, you know, one thing that governments can also do. But lastly, uh, we can also think about social protection uh, programs. So there's various governments that have got programs which give, you know, free food commodities to, you know, vulnerable people in society, making sure that when they give that food is fortified will help. We could also look at, you know, those, uh, those countries where they have already uh, social protection programs given the expected increase uh, in the price of commodities, what it means is, it is it's going to push a, a bit more people into poverty. Can you they increase or expand the scope of those social protection programs? And finally, for those that give you know, 
cash transfer uh, to, to, to vulnerable in society, given the expected increase or the increase in, uh, in commodities, you know, governments should also be thinking about increasing the cash transfer so that you know, the vulnerable and the poor in society can be able to afford uh, procurement of uh, fortified food. So that's, that's what I would say as some of the uh, actions that can be taken to mitigate uh, the impacts. Thank you, Pinjani. Thank you.